Hello out there, Radio Land. This is Michael. This is the Street Preacher's Corner Podcast, where we will continue to try to do this until the internet completely dies. Well, folks, I'm going to talk about something a little differently, uh, uh, a thing. You know, if, if you've been listening for very long, you know that we here at the Street Preacher's Corner, we occasionally delve into a little bit of American history, a little bit of church history, because I think these things are very, very important. And with the 4th of July coming up, with the celebration of the American independence coming up, I thought it'd be as good a time as any to talk about, um, you know, we talk about America being the land of the free. Uh, that freedom did not come all at once. The idea of that freedom did not come all at once. A lot of things that were happening in America in the colonial days and then the early revolutionary days and the early days of the Republic, people were still figuring out how they thought about things or what they thought about things because were there, the idea that a group of people would govern themselves from among themselves, that was that was so foreign uh, to the human experience, or had been for, for, for a while. And a lot of the things that America uh, was built upon were things that other civilizations had tried and failed at, or other civilizations had tried, and we kind of forgot about them. And I said all that to say this, uh, it, it has been my great privilege to have lived my life uh, in a land where great religious liberty still exists. Uh, even as a decline, America has seen more freedom than possibly any other nation but like i said you need to understand that it was not always that way when the people came here I mean, we t- we've talked about the puritans before we've talked about the quakers before we've talked about the anabaptists before when the puritans came here they did not come here to have religious liberty in the sense that you and i understand it they came here to seek religious liberty for themselves uh at the expense of everybody else they were here to start a theocracy and that meant that there was one church, and it was state-funded, and that you would be a member of that church, or you would uh, not attend church. Uh, and we've gone through all that stuff. Um, you know, uh, church officials held political offices back back in the day, uh, and uh, especially in 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 in. Let me put it this way: Colonial America was not this I- idyllic utopia of liberty, at least not you know, in the beginning. But it was sort of a sort of a patchwork quilt of different understandings. And tolerances of what freedom was all about. So, so in lots of places, especially in places where the Church of England uh, was dominant, like Massachusetts and Virginia, the line between church and state was so blurry that it really didn't exist. I mean, the, the, the mindset at the time was, and I don't know if you've never heard our stuff on this, we've covered this issue at length. The mindset at the time was that why wouldn't the church be in charge of the government? Why wouldn't why wouldn't the, the most righteous people in the community be the ones that make the laws? Why wouldn't the people that that have that have, that have been uh, granted uh, by God and by the by the conference of the congregation with great authority? Why wouldn't they be also fit to exercise that authority in secular matters? And I'm not going to say I totally disagree with that, but it did lend, it did wind up with some pretty scary stuff that went on. You have things like the witch trials in Salem, and you have this uh, ordinance that was passed in 1644 that. Uh, uh, called the Anabaptists the troublers of churches in all places where they have been. And in 1656, when the first Quakers started getting here at the shores of Massachusetts, the Quakers were uh, imprisoned by their Puritan brothers. The women were strip-searched under pretense of looking for witches, and their religious literature, literature was burned as heresy. So that's the land of the free and the home of the brave there. And it was this way, at least in the beginning, because that is how people of a community chose to live. They moved there to Massachusetts. They moved there to Virginia to start a theocracy, to start a place where the church was the state and the state was the church. And if you didn't like that, if you disagreed with that, you could leave. And sometimes they did, starting their own little communities a bit deeper in the great American wilderness. Uh, Some people were banished, but not everybody could leave, and not everybody thought they should have to leave. So for those that stayed, life could be pretty hard. You had um, church law that was codified into secular law, and with that came an entire hierarchy of church officials and creeds that sort of contempt attempted to coerce the conscience of, of everyone under their jurisdiction to worship as the hierarchy demanded. You will go to church here, this is what you believe, or you will not go to church anywhere. And there's lots of uh, lots of examples of that. James Madison had said, all men with power ought to be distrusted to a certain degree, and that certainly rang true, as well-intentioned men persecuted their brothers and sisters using the power of the state to enforce their religious convictions. Now, in the middle of all this going on, side by side with this, uh, this big, you know, big religious behemoth, 
were these little pockets of men and women who followed their conscience regardless of what the ruling powers thought. They worshipped in secret and they worshipped in openly. Uh, the Rogerines they did a great thing on that. Um, and they did that regardless of what the status quo, whatever, what the rich and powerful uh, thought. They preached outside of established church buildings and they took the gospel out in public as the Bible commands. And for their troubles, they were fined and banished and beaten and arrested and imprisoned. Uh, their ears were cut off sometimes, and hot irons were driven through their blasphemous tongues. Uh, their church buildings were burned, their property seized. These were Quakers, these were Baptists, these were Anabaptists, these were a variety of other groups uh, who all just wanted to live in peace and, 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 and live in accordance with their dictates of their conscience and worship God as they saw fit. They sought to practice what would later be called soul liberty. The idea behind soul liberty is that you believe what you believe and you're at liberty to to worship God as you understand God wants to be worshipped. Okay, that doesn't mean no one ever talks to you about it. That doesn't mean no one ever confronts you about it. That doesn't mean no one takes the scripture and tries to correct you if you're wrong. But it does mean that the state cannot come in and tell you, here's the here's what you will do, here's what you will believe, here's what you will say. So, so in, in the colonial days, in Massachusetts and in Virginia, I think Virginia was probably a little quicker to change, make some changes than Massachusetts was, but there was a a real shift of, of, of the way the colonies thought about this. And this sort of heavy heel of, you know, ecclesiastical uh, oppression was the fuel for the fire of soul liberty. And as men began to ask themselves what freedom was all about, uh, there came a, a sort of a rebirth, a rediscovery of the ideas and a commitment to the idea of religious liberty. People saw what they were becoming and it shocked them enough to change course. And because of that, that change, Generations have reaped the benefit of religious freedom. I can preach on the street now because guys in the 1600s preached on the street and went to jail for it. So I want to tell you one little story and one little facet of one little one little thing in one little corner of the world involves a handful of Baptist preachers and a couple of famous names. It's one small trial on one small area with just a little sliver of life of, of one of America's founders, but this sliver sets the stage for a discussion, and this discussion set the stage for a debate that eventually changed the course of history. So I'm going to talk to you about the players on the field. I'm going to talk to you about a guy named John Waller, a guy named Lewis Craig, a guy named James Childs, a guy named James Reed, and a guy you may have heard of named Patrick Henry, and a guy you may have heard of called Thomas Jefferson. And I'm going to try to get through this in a semi-timely manner. Now, these were men of like passion such as we are. Uh, they were men with wives and children and expenses and reputations, but I think it's worth mentioning they risked it all for the proclamation of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And as their legacy, as the recipient of the fruit of their labors, we should be willing to do the same. So let's talk about John Waller. And John Waller, <coughs> born in uh, uh, 1741, a couple days before Christmas, and he was not a respectable fellow. He was, he was from a respectable, God-fearing family, but he was not a respectable, God-fearing sort of fellow. In fact, he was a gambler with a bad temper, and he got the name of Swearing Jack, or more, more colorfully, as the devil's adjutant. <laughs> so, uh, he had some legal training. And so basically, he's just a swearing, drinking, gambling heathen. And, but, he, but he was a trained lawyer. And um, from that, he used his legal skills to persecute the Baptists in, in Virginia. And in Spotsylvania, uh, Spotsylvania County, um, particularly. And so, he, you know, he, the fact that he was so good at putting Baptists in jail made him a more tolerable member of the community. People could put up with the fact that he was a, a, a cursing, swearing, gambling heathen because he was really good at putting Baptist preachers in jail. And so uh, he got assigned to a grand jury in 1766. And in 1766, he met the, a guy named Lewis Craig. And Lewis Craig was a street preacher. Craig had been brought up to trial for holding illegal religious meetings. The idea was that the Church of England issued you a license to preach. And if you did not have a license to preach, you could go to jail for holding church services. And so Lewis Craig had actually been arrested for preaching out in the street. And uh, he had a history of this. And the grand jury decided that the evidence was sufficient for him to go to trial. Now, many of the grand jury uh, 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 members, they felt like only not only had justice been served by getting this guy off the street, but it was one less of those pesky Baptist street preachers <clears throat> that uh, they had, had been dealt with. And so they were so glad 
that the thing was going to trial that the, the grand jury adjourned to the local tavern to celebrate. And John Waller was among them. And so as, they're on these, as this group of jurors and legal folks are on their way to the tavern to, to celebrate the fact that a street preacher is going to go to trial, uh, the street preacher is following them to the tavern. Lewis Craig followed them there, and he bought them around drinks, and he told them, I thank you, gentlemen of the grand jury, for the honor you have done me. While I was wicked and injurious, you took no note of me, but since I altered my course of life and endeavored to reform my neighbors, you concern yourself much about me. I have gotten this mug of grog to treat you with, and shall take the spoiling of my goods joyfully. And so, uh, that that bothered that bothered uh, John Craig. I'm sorry, that bothered John Waller. And but he didn't. He couldn't let people know about it. And so, what he began to do was he began to secretly attend Baptist meetings, including those that had been held by Lewis Craig. And when Craig and his company would hold their public meetings, where they got in the street and preach, Waller would stay at the edge of the crowd, listening, but appearing not to. And in 1776, about a year after the grand jury experience, Waller surrendered his all to Jesus Christ. And this is a quote from Waller. I have long felt the greatest abhorrence of myself and began almost to despair of the mercy of God. However, I determined never to rest until it pleased God to show mercy or cut me off. Under these impressions, I was at a certain place, sitting under preaching. On a sudden, a man exclaimed that he had found mercy. And began to praise God. No mouth can describe the horror with which I was seized that instant. I began to conclude that my damnation was certain. Leaving the meeting, I hastened into a neighboring wood and dropped on my knees before God to beg for mercy. In that instant, I felt my heart melt and the sweet application of the Redeemer's love to my poor soul. I mean, that's something, right? So after he gets converted, Waller becomes one of the most ardent proclaimers of the gospel in Orange County in Spotsylvania County, Virginia. He's baptized with James Reed. He sold, he sold his property to pay off his gambling debts. And he became the best friend of Lewis Craig, the guy he'd indicted as a lawyer for preaching out in public. In time, he would organize a church and be their pastor. Actually, I have a quote here about him. Uh, he was considered, by the ungodly, he was considered a, quote, bold, inexorable fanatic which would do much mischief instead, unless restrained. So he starts a church, and he's their pastor, and during the course of his life, he endures great persecution. In fact, he endured a beating in 1771 at the hands of the local sheriff that scarred him for the rest of his life. He would spend 113 days in four different jails over the course of the next 35 years. But that's we're getting ahead of ourselves. In 1768, he was arrested, and that's where we're going to concern ourselves. We've got to talk about the other guys in the play. We talked about John Waller. Talk about Lewis Craig. Lewis Craig was the guy that uh, John Waller had indicted. He was born in Virginia to a pious family of Puritans. Uh, but according to all accounts, he was dead in trespasses and sins until he was 25 or 26 years old when he heard a street preacher named Samuel Harris uh, preaching outside. For months, he would follow Sam Harris around, peppering him with questions about eternal things and lamenting that he must surely be lost and undone before God. When he was 27, he settled it all within his heart and immediately began to preach in attempting to give the gospel to his old Anglican priest. Now I gotta I gotta put a pause here and say that the, the records on this are not a hundred percent you know bulletproof, and uh, some places say that he actually family actually came from a, a devout uh, Baptist family. But anyway, so this this newfound zeal of his uh, called caused him a split with his family with the Anglican community, and soon he found himself preaching all over Virginia. His soul-winning efforts led to the establishment of the First Baptist Church in Lower Spotsylvania, according to James Taylor. Quote, he traveled almost constantly, and the large congregations which everywhere attended his ministry were entreated to escape the divine wrath with the most impassioned earnestness. Nothing could exceed the burning zeal with which he persuaded men to be reconciled to God. His sermons consisted in a plain, pungent exhibition of the evil of sin and its ruinous consequences with the glad tidings of redeeming love through a Savior. Hundreds of his hearers found in these announcements the means to salvation. The gospel came to them, not only in word only, but in power and the Holy Ghost with much assurance. Now, in 1780, uh, there's all this persecution going on in Virginia. He takes his congregation, and he moves to Kentucky, 
and he starts a profitable work until his death in the 80s. He was one of those guys who lived long enough to live on both sides of America's uh, experience with religious intolerance, and he could tell the to story as an old man about the way things used to be. So much of his life and his ministry um, happened after his arrest in 1768, and there are stories we're telling, but, but here it is in June 68 that we have to focus our attention. Let's talk about James Childs. We don't know almost anything about the guy. We know he had a sturdy set of limbs and a resolute spirit, which he used to bruise the body of his, of his countrymen. And uh, he was converted when he was in his 20s. And it was in June of 1768, he was with Lewis Craig and James Wheeler when they were arrested. Now, 4th of June, 1768, John Waller, Lewis Craig, James Chow and James Reed were all arrested while preaching in public. The charge was that they were disturbing the peace, with the prosecutor at their trial claiming, May it please your worship, these men are great disturbers of the peace. They cannot meet a man upon the road, but they must ram a text of scripture down his throat. You know what's nice to know? It's nice to know that we're keeping the tradition going. It's nice to know that we're doing the same thing that, that they did back then, and that they're saying the same things about us that they did back then. But anyway, uh, after their arrest, the, the charge of holding religious meetings contrary to the law of the land was added because they, these guys had no license from the Church of England. The bond was set at 2,000 pounds, which one historian says is a king's ransom. John Corbley, a local preacher, met with them and offered to be surety for them, putting his life or his family farm at risk should they decide to post bond. They declined. And Waller, like I said, Waller started out life as a lawyer persecuting Christians. Now he's inside the jail cell. And he wanted to argue their court uh, case before the magistrates, and a deal was offered them. They would be released on the one condition they had agreed not to preach in public for a length of one year and one day. Well, they refused. So they were marched to the jail in Fredericksburg. Along the way, they broke out into a chorus of an old Isaac Watts hymn, Broad is the way that leads to death. Broad is the road that leads to death, and thousands walk together there. But wisdom shows a narrower path with here and there a traveler. Deny thyself and take thy cross is the Redeemer's great command. Nature must count her gold but dross if she would gain this heavenly land. The fearful soul that tires and faints and walks the ways of God no more is but esteemed almost a saint and makes his own destruction sure. Lord, let all my hopes be not in vain. Create my hope entirely new, which hypocrites could ne'er attain, which false apostates never knew. Now, after a month in jail, they had secured their two of them and secured their release. The record's a little bit different about which one it is, but whoever they were, they made a trip to the deputy governor of Williamsburg, Virginia, to plead the case of their comrade that was still in jail. And in July of 1768, a letter was written on their behalf from the deputy governor to the king's attorney. And it says, Sir, I lately received a letter signed by a good number of worthy gentlemen who are not here complaining of the Baptists. The particulars of their misbehavior are not told any further than their running into private houses and making dissensions. Mr. Craig and Mr. Waller are with me, and they deny the charge. They told me they are willing to take the oath as others have. I told them the Attorney General is of the opinion that the General Court only has the power to grant licenses and refer them to the court. But on their application to the Attorney General, they brought me his letter, advising me to write you that their petition is a matter of right, and you may not molest these conscientious people so long as they behave themselves in a manner becoming pious Christians, and in obedience to the laws, till the court when they apply for their licenses, and when the gentlemen who complain may make their objections and be heard. The act of toleration, it being found by experience that persecuting dissenters increases their numbers, has given them a right to apply in a proper manner for licensed houses of worship according to me and to their consciences, and I persuade myself that the gentlemen will quietly overlook their meetings till the court. I am told they administer the sacraments of the Lord's Supper, uh, near the manner we do, but differ nothing from their church, but that, that baptism, and that they're renewed penitent. Now, if a man of theirs is idle and neglect to labor and provide for his family, I'm sorry, hold on, I skipped a line here, and in the renewing of the ancient discipline, they've reformed some sinners and brought some to be truly penitent. Now, if a man of theirs is idle and neglect to labor and provide for his family, as he ought, he incurs their censure, which have had good effects. If this behavior, their behavior, if it would be wished we'd have some of it among us, well, at least I hope all men may require remain quiet into a court. I am, with great respects to you gentlemen, your humble servant, John Blair Williamsburg, July 16, 1768. 
So what these fellows did, they said, look, we are going to continue doing this. And so we're going to apply for a license to, to be an established and recognized religious group. And that'll get the court off our back. And we have the right under English law to petition the court for a license uh, to meet separate from the main from the main the main group there. Well, that 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 pleading failed, and so now these fellows, these four fellows, are going to court to uh, to to establish their religious liberty. And I'm trying to find the rest of my notes. Here we are. So what happened was, I, 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 the notes are like, I don't know where they're at. But uh, the, uh, the the court, the case went to trial. Patrick Henry argued on their on their behalf. That Patrick Henry, give me liberty, give me death. He went there and he argued for him. He got these guys released. And so that all went well. They ever, it was a happy ending. The street preachers won and life went on. And those guys were able to meet and, and, and follow the dictates of their own conscience. But that, moving forward... Um, that, that incident, incidents like it, they caused a great discussion among the founding generation as the colonies moved closer and closer to independence. Local statutes were enacted and drafted by what would some become some of the most famous men in history. These statutes were put in place to protect the consciences of free men from coercion by the state. They presented in writing a, a, a sort of philosophical thread that grew and grew until it became the First Amendment of the, of the U.S. Constitution. You can take the First Amendment, you can trace it directly back to the First Amendment is a reaction, a, a codified reaction to what had happened under English law. The guys that, 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 that wanted that assurance in the Constitution knew about the, the, the case back then with, with those four fellows. So one of the most prominent things, so what you have, you have, you have, you have this case law and you have local statutes that eventually are in place in the states. And then when you're asking the states to ratify the, the constitution, they're saying we will, but you have to put in religious protection to match what we have in our state constitution. What we have in our state law books. So one of the most prominent of these, of these, these laws that was drafted was drafted by Thomas Jefferson. I don't know if you ever heard of him. And in 1777, he was adopted, it was adopted in 1786 and it was entitled an act for establishing religious freedom. And so Thomas Jefferson laid out what, what powers the state did not have, but why they didn't have them. And I, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cite a couple of prominent lines, <coughs> and, and, and I'm going to talk about maybe just briefly where I think Amer things are headed in America, where I hope things are headed in America. Um, it is an axiom in my mind that all natural rights are interconnected. The principles behind one can be applied to the other, as, as you'll see. So here's a quote from Thomas Jefferson in his act for the establishment of religious freedom. Almighty God hath created the mind free, that all attempts to influence it by temporal punishments or burdens, or by civil incapacitations, tend only to beget habits of hypocrisy and meanness. Pretty good, right? Uh, he says, No man can be compelled to furnish contributions of money for the propagation of opinions which he believes is sinful and tyrannical. Well, I hate to tell, I hate to break it to you, Mr. Jefferson. But that happens every day in America now. It is, it, I believe it's wrong to steal, so I'm stolen from. I believe it's wrong to mooch, so my stolen money is used to support moochers. Abortions are funded out of my pocket all day long. I am forced in America in 2024 to pay for things that are against my conviction. But according to Thomas Jefferson, it ought not be so. Let's see here. Truth is great and will prevail if left to herself. That she is the proper and sufficient antagonist to error, and has nothing to fear from the conflict, unless by humor in interposition, disarmed of her natural weapons of free argument and debate. So as a minister of the gospel, uh, I hold that in a society where there's no state religion offers me the greatest opportunity to persuade men from the scriptures by earnest and heartfelt discussions, and it offers me the greatest opportunity to hear their rebuttals. And Thomas Jefferson would agree. That where you where you implement a a religious order under the force with, with the state behind it, you stifle any real search for truth. You stifle any real discussion among free men about what is and is not true. 
Uh, here we go. Be it enacted by general assembly that no man shall be compelled to frequent or support any religious worship, place, or ministry whatsoever. Now, where that falls apart in America is I believe that atheism has all the trappings and woke and wokeism has all the trappings of a religion, and it is taught uh, by the compulsory government schools. Compulsory government education has been one of the greatest and most successful tools in robbing people not only of truth, but of the ability to recognize the truth when it's presented to them. Now, Thomas Jefferson, who is my favorite president, he proved himself in, in drafting this legislation way back, you know, before before all, a lot of this other stuff was happening. Uh, he, he proved himself to not only be an intellectual giant, but a man who understood the issue and was able to get to the heart of it. His arguments, his logic, his very, his very words uh, later became the heart of the First Amendment. And, and that was an amendment that you will not, you, we will not ratify this Constitution. We will not accept it. We will not submit ourselves unto it unless these protections are in place. So he said, well, where are you going with this? You have religious freedom because street preachers went to jail. You have religious freedom because men met in their houses without a license and tried to teach the Bible. You have a religious liberty because men passed out tracts that they'd published at their own expense and they were arrested and they went to jail for it. That is my entire point. You have your liberty today because, because men said, this is how we think it ought to work. And we're willing not to just write ang sternly worded letters. They're willing to go out there and suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune and to go to jail if necessary. And I think there's a pendulum and I think we're swinging back towards the other way. I think I will eventually go to, I, you know, I get threatened with arrest three or four times a year, maybe. Uh, I get conversations with the police five or six times a year, seven year, eight times a year, depending on what's going on, depending on where we're at. Um, and I believe that eventually I will go to jail. I will be presented with the opportunity to go to jail in great earnestness before this is all over. And I have my own ideas about how I think that's going to pan out. I think it's going to be, I think what they're going to say uh, is that we're causing a disturbance. I think they're going to say that we're hate speech. I think they're going to say that we're offending a protected group. I think all that stuff's going to happen. And when that happens, I guess we'll find out if I was just blowing smoke all these years. I guess we'll find out if I really got the goods. Now, I don't think you go to jail necessarily just to prove a point. Because truth be told, I go to jail... Uh, my family's income stops. And I have an obligation to to take care of my family. I have an obligation to figure out some kind of way in which I can obey God because part of obeying God is to take care of my family. But what I don't have is the obligation to hide behind my family and say, well, I'm going to, I'm doing this for my family. I'm doing this for, for my, look, we just went through this America. We just went through four years ago where people were given a choice not to go to jail necessarily, although some people did get arrested for not wearing masks in public, as silly as that was. Uh, but some people went to uh, lost their 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 livelihoods because they would not violate their own conscience. So that that revolutionary spirit still exists in America. I think the Church of God needs to harness it. I think the Church of God needs to find it. So, happy 4th of July-ish. This has been Michael. This has been the Street Preacher's Corner Podcast. It is 90 degrees in this room where I'm recording this. Man. This is Michael. This has been the Street Preacher's Corner, po Corner Podcast. Thank you for listening, all four of you. And please, while there's still time, go out and do something for Jesus Christ. Risk your life, if necessary, for Jesus Christ. You won't regret it. And remember, nobody ever got the chance to die for Jesus who wasn't already living for Jesus. Okay, thank you and have a good night.